a brief introduction to the bash shell. Uh, this is heavily based on the software carpentry's introduction to the shell lesson. If any of you are familiar with software carpentries uh, or the carpentries now, they're a fantastic organization. Um, I would highly recommend that you just Google the carpentries uh, and look them up. They have a lot of lessons for getting a, learning the basics of um, the shell, Python, different data analysis tools, um, and for different research domains as well. Uh, so I've based this on that, uh, that lesson. And before we get started, um, we're going to be working in this lesson with a data set. So I'm going to just post this in the chat. Um, if you could click on that, download that data set. It's very small. Uh, it's a single zip file. And you can just unzip it onto your desktop. Some of the commands that we run are just going to be looking at that data directory. Um, so I'll give everyone time to, to do that. It should just be a one-click download. Uh, again, that's posted in the chat. And um, like I said, download it, unzip it to your desktop. It should just be a directory called data-shell. Uh, and we're going to be navigating that in a little bit. All right. So what is the shell? Um, as JB kind of prefaced, the shell is a command line interface to your computer. Um, and so that's often addressed, uh, abbreviated as a CLI. And this is in contrast to uh, what we normally use are graphical user interfaces. So your browser is a graphical user interface uh, to the web. Your file explorer is a graphical inter user interface to your kind of file system. Um, and so the shell just allows you a, a little bit of a, you know, kind of programmatic access to all of those tools. It's also, as, he's, as JB said, a scripting language. And so you can use the shell and commands therein to automate repetitive tasks, makes things reproducible, reproducible make them much, much, much faster. Um, you know, if you need to, to you know, rename a thousand files um, in a really kind of you know, strict way, uh, that is not something that you're going to want to be point and click doing. So, so but. We've been referring to the Bash shell. We stress that you need to have Bash installed on your computer. Um, and so the Bash shell is one of many available shells. I've listed a few here. This isn't comprehensive. There are actually more. Um, so there's just SH, which is the Born shell. That's kind of the most generic shell that there is. There's the K shell, Dash, C shell, T, T C shell, Z shell, uh, and then finally Bash, or the Born Again shell. And we're going to be focusing on that last one. Um, uh, a small note, Mac Catalina, which is the latest Mac update, has changed. It used to, the default shell used to be Bash. It is now Z shell. Uh, there are some reasons for that. Um, they're primarily licensing reasons uh, that I'm not going to describe here, but uh, happy to chat about. It was mostly just Apple's proprietary nonsense that motivated that switch. So, um, why are there so many shells is a really fantastic question. I like to think that it's just because humans are like little raccoons and they like nice new shiny things. And so there's always this motivation to just kind of constantly create something new that suits your needs. Um, and they're always kind of searching for the shiny things. But uh, they do all have kind of different strengths and weaknesses. They were developed at different points in history for different reasons. Uh, honestly, a surprising amount of them were developed based on you know, certain aspects of previous ones being proprietary and companies wanting to you know, use something new that they had full control over. Um, but you will see a lot of different uh, shells used throughout a lot of neuroimaging software. So if you're familiar with the uh, neuroimaging software package FSL, a lot of their scripts are written in just uh, the Born shell or SH. Free Surfer and AFNI, if you're familiar with those, also very powerful neuroimaging software. Those are, uh, they use a lot of C shell and T shell to write their, their scripts and code. Um, so we're gonna focus on the Bash shell for today. I would recommend that you kind of stick with this for uh, the foreseeable future for Brain Hack School. It's the default on um, Linux, it's the default on the Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows. Um, and it's the default on all of the older Macs. As I said, the new one is different, although you can modify and change that to be Bash. You can change your default on Mac. Um, and I would recommend that you do. I have on my, my Mac computer personally. 
um, and Bash is still available. So I think there was a question earlier during the install session, can I use Z-Shell? Uh, for the purposes of this lecture, no. For the purposes of the future, sure, if you want, uh, totally your call, but it, it's maybe a little bit more difficult to Google things for help, uh, which is one of the primary ways to learn how to do things in Bash. So why use the shell at all? Isn't the GUI good enough? As I kind of hinted at before, if you have a task like needing to rename 1,000 files, that's not something that you're going to want to go into your file explorer, right click on each file, hit rename and type the name. Um, that's, that's not at all something that's fun to do. Um, and usually I find that people who have used uh, the shell before in their you know, kind of day to day, it's motivated by a use case like that. I first got, you know, experience using the shell when I was a research assistant and I was tasked with doing just that. I had a bunch of neuroimaging data that I needed to organize uh, into, a, into a file structure and I did not want to spend, you know, day in, day out dragging and dropping little file icons. So the shell is really powerful. It allows you to do things very, very quickly and reproducibly. Um, you can string together sequences of commands to make very powerful pipelines. Um, and you critically need the shell, uh, some nice typos, um, to access remote machines or high performance computing environments. So we're gonna get a full uh, afternoon on high performance com computing environments from somebody from Compute Canada on Wednesday, uh, Felix Antoine Fortin. He's fantastic. So he's gonna tell you all about that, but the shell kind of gives you access to those. There are graphical user interfaces, things like Cygwin um, that you may be familiar with, but the shell really kind of shines. That's where, they're, that's where it's uh, designed for use. So as I said, we cannot cover all or even most aspects of the shell today. We're gonna to get through some very, very basic fundamentals. Again, I apologize if you have you know, a lot of experience programming in the shell. This may be a bit slow. Hopefully there's one or two new things that you might learn uh, about, but um, these, are, these are really the fundamentals that you'll need for the rest of Rainhack School. So thankfully, you've already used the Bash shell um, uh, at multiple points throughout the installation instruction. Um, if we had you, you know, opening up the Ubuntu terminal or your command prompt or whatever and typing different co commands, almost all of those were in Bash, uh, especially that final uh, step where you were asked to check your setup, that command, it explicitly references bash. Um, what we were doing is we were downloading a script that I'd written uh, from the web and you were running that in your terminal to check everything. So I know JB earlier had showed a, uh, a little graph in his introduction to the you know, course where how many people have used these different programming languages. You can now all say that you have used uh, bash. So that's at hundred already. Um, but we're going to kind of get into a little bit more about uh, what all of those commands were doing. So, Ross, we've got just a few questions here. Yep. Um, yes, so, for Windows users, should we download the zip to Windows desktop or WSL directory? Uh, that's a great question. So it's probably easiest for you to, uh, to download it to your Windows desktop. Um, you can download it to a WSL directory um, and kind of, kind of move it there. You will be able to access it from the, the W. If it's on your Windows desktop, you will be able to access it from the WSL. So um, I would say just for ease, uh, you know, kind of just, just stick it right on your desktop for now. Uh, regarding does it make a difference if I use the terminal versus iTerm on a Mac? Uh, it should not, as long as you are making sure that whichever one you're using is the Bash shell. Um, terminal as I said, depending on your version of Mac, will be either Bash or Z shell. If you're not sure, uh, we're gonna actually get right into that uh, in a sec um, to check which one you're using. So uh, to get started, uh, I'm gonna ask you to all open up a terminal. So the idea is that we're gonna be going through, there's gonna be some empty code cells uh, throughout my presentation that I'm going to be typing commands into. I highly recommend that you type as, as, uh, as I go. If you run into issues, you can raise them in the chat. I'll try and address them kind of in, in real time. Um, and then there's gonna be, we'll try and take a break maybe halfway through. Uh, again, one hour to get through kind of an introduction to Bash. It's not a lot of time. So uh, apologies if I'm going quickly, but um, we'll try and get through all of this content. So you may see when you're, you're, you open your terminal, you're presented with a prompt indicating that the shell is waiting for input. Um, by default, uh, that is the dollar sign. Um, so the shell typically uses that. It may be set to something different. You may see like 
your username at the name of your computer dollar sign. Uh, the dollar sign basically means the, the shell is now waiting for you to do something. Um, when you see commands written with a dollar sign, it usually means this is a command that you're supposed to copy and run, but do not copy the, the, the dollar sign. Uh, that is, that shouldn't be included. So I don't think that the dollar sign will make, uh, will be present in any of the commands that I'm going to be typing, but um, just for future reference, don't, don't, don't do that. So we're going to get started by using the following command to determine what shell you're running. So if you've opened up your terminal, you can just type this, this command. It is echo and then shell. And you should see something printed out on your screen like uh, bin slash bash. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the file structure uh, in a sec. But if you see something different, if you see like bin slash z shell, um, what you can do is you can just type the word bash and hit enter and then try running this command again. And you should see bin slash bash. Uh, if, you if anyone has any issues, please kind of raise them in the chat right now or else you're going to be uh, a bit confused for the remainder of the lecture as we go through and we're typing bash commands. Um, Russ, do you want us to do quick polls on Slack for this sort of question or what, how do you want to proceed? What do you mean quick polls? Uh, I like, mean, how, uh, how many people have, you know, reached that stage? Uh, okay, like, you know. Um, I mean, the commands that uh, we're typing are going to be very, very brief. Um, so they're not, okay. they're not anything that, you know, you kind of are going to maybe fall behind on. It's always going to be one command at a time. You're going to be going pretty slowly, like I said. Uh, so if you, if you have, if you, you know, run the command, you run into an issue, uh, quickly post it in the chat and I'll try and address it right on the fly. If it's something longer, please, you know, post it and maybe one of the, the TA, the other TAs can kind of get to it uh, in due time or at a break. Um, Thank you. So, okay. So like I said, uh, if you don't see that type bash, press enter, try their command again, and you are now in the bash shell. So we're going to get through, um, you know, the rest of this. So uh, just to note, the echo command there is specific to bash and it does exactly what its name implies. It just prints or echoes whatever we provide afterwards to the screen. So it's very similar to the print command in Python and R or the disp command in MATLAB or the printf command in C or kind of every programming language has a way to print things to the screen. And in uh, bash echo is kind of the one of the most common ones. So that's what that's doing there. And then what's with this kind of dollar sign shell thing? So beyond being used for the prompt, as I said, when you, you, know, you see that dollar sign at the beginning, that means it's, the shell is waiting for your input. Uh, when you see words prefixed with the dollar sign in bash, these are environmental variables. So all programming languages have variables. It's things that you can you know, assign values to. Um, and we will assign some values in bash uh, in a, in a, uh, later on. But when we assign the variable in bash, we can say, you know, my variable equals 10. When I want to then call that, I need to add the dollar sign prefix for bash to know that it is a variable and not a command because by default, bash assumes things are commands. Um, so we'll dig into this in a, a little bit more detail later on, assuming we have time. Uh, but by default, our shell comes with some preset variables. So dollar sign shell is one of them. It tells you what shell you're currently running. Uh, and there are a whole host of other ones. You can see a full list uh, by running the env command, env, which stands for environment, to see your environment uh, in the shell. So if you do that, it's going to print out a huge long thing of all of the variables that you have currently declared and their values. It's going to be totally overwhelming. A lot of them don't mean anything. I honestly don't know what about three quarters of the ones are um, at any given time. But for your purposes, that is something that you can do. So we're going to get started by trying our first, second command in bash, really the second, because we just did that echo shell one. Uh, and so this command is going to list the contents of our current directory. So if we just type ls, uh, we're going to see a bunch of things. Uh, your view of this is going to look very different than my view of this because it's going to be specific to your computer, your current directory, uh, and so on and so forth. But I'm on a Mac. Um, I have some external applications that have created new new directories in my you know kind of home, uh, and this is what I see. So uh, you know, good question is what happens if we make a typo? Uh, K is right next to L, and that is a very frequent typo for me. Uh, so bash raises this moderately helpful error message when you mess up. So if, as you're going along, you see something like blah, 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 bash something, command not found, 
probably means that as you were typing it into the terminal, you, you made a mistake, which is the most common thing to do. Um, so the, that is kind of one of the, the downsides of the CLI is that uh, when you're using a GUI, you know, a file explorer, you can, you know, right click on a file and it gives you a whole bunch of helpful options, move to, rename, delete, etc. When you're using the shell and the CLI, you need to know the names of the commands that you want to run. And those names are not always immediately obvious. So for example, ls lists the contents of the directory. Why wouldn't it just be list underscore contents or something that's you know, exactly what it's doing? Uh, the rationale is that they wanted to keep these kind of very common commands short so that it's easier to type so that you're not constantly typing very long phrases for things that you're running very, very frequently. But this is kind of one of the drawbacks um, to the CLI. And so it can be a little bit difficult. Uh, so just to kind of summarize up to now, we discussed the shell is, it's a program, main purpose, accepting commands, running programs, uh, and running those commands, executing them. Uh, its main advantages are its high quote unquote action to keystroke ratio. Uh, that is, you can do a lot with a very short phrase. So LS lists your contents, you don't need to type a lot to do, uh, to do stuff. It's support for automating repetitive tasks and its capacity to access remote machines. Uh, as we said, we're gonna get into that a lot on Wednesday afternoon. The shell's main disadvantages are its primarily textual nature and how cryptic its commands and operations can be. Uh, so it can be very frustrating to have to kind of try and re reason out why the commands are named what they are or what the name for a command is that you know you should be able to do. Um, we'll get a little bit into how to kind of find out what the different commands can do uh, in a bit, but by and large, the best resource is just Googling uh, how to, and then whatever you want to do on in Bash or on Linux is usually a good reference. I would say that I do that um, at least a dozen times a day. So, to, to be comfortable with the, with the shell, you really need to understand navigating files and directories. Um, the file system is the part of our operating system for managing files, directories, applications, everything. Everything on your computer is stored in the computer's file system. Um, and the, the shell really shines because there are tons of commands for making and deleting files, renaming them, inspecting them, kind of finding them. Um, and these are the commands that we're gonna go over today because those are the most common commands that you'll be using in the shell. Um, as I said, kind of one of the big motivators for the shell is, you know, I need to rename 1000 files. How do I do it quickly and efficiently? Um, a lot of the functionality of the shell is based around managing this file system. There's obviously a ton of other commands that we are not gonna have time to go over today that allow the shell to do a lot of other things. Uh, but I think that the goal for today is just to get that foundation and then uh, on the, the rest of the weeks, um, you can kind of begin to build on those and explore the other functionality. So uh, where are we right now? When we opened our terminal, we're someplace in the file system. At any given time in the shell, you're ex in exactly one place. Uh, and so commands mostly read or write or operate wherever you are. And so it's important to know where you are. Uh, so we can find our current working directory with the following command. It's pwd. Um, and that, as with most commands, are abbreviations or acronyms. So pwd stands for print working directory. Um, and so right now I'm in slash users slash rmarkello. My name is Ross Markello. Oh yeah, JB, I never did my introduction. Uh, I'll, well, we'll, we'll punt that to the end. Um, no need to interrupt the flow right now. So, um, so yeah, if everyone types PWD, you're gonna see something totally different. Again, this is gonna be slightly operating system dependent. Some of you may be seeing like slash home slash, um, you know, R Markello or, or something completely different. If you're on the WSL, um, you, you may see something even entirely different from that. So, uh, Yes, it's gonna, it's gonna be quite different. Um, we're just because I'm, I'm working on a Mac right now, we're gonna be assuming the kind of slash users slash R Markello notation for the rest of these examples. If your notation is a little bit different, that's fine. Um, window, this is one of the most frustrating things. If you're using the WSL on Windows, you should see these uh, forward slashes um, that, that I'm, I'm pointing to down here, the slash user slash R Markello. If you're using the command prompt or PowerShell on Windows, you're gonna see these backslashes. Um, so 
that's just a Windows versus uh, everyone else difference. Um, this kind of trips a lot of people up when they're working on Windows and they're kind of going back and forth between the command prompt or PowerShell and Bash. Um, it's just that the different operating systems use these different slashes as delimiters or separators between directories on their file system. So as an example file system, uh, I apologize that this picture is a little bit small. Um, we have uh, at the root of our file system, this slash directory. And then we're gonna have a, a few different directories therein. Uh, it's gonna be different based on your computer, but common ones are like bin or data or users or temp. Um, and so that top directory is called the root directory. It holds your entire file system. Uh, again, on Windows, this is a little bit different, but for example, the C drive on Windows is your kind of equivalent of a root directory. Um, inside the root directory, which is your whole file system, are the rest of your files and directories. So here, bin uh, contains some built-in programs. Um, for example, when you type echo shell, that slash bin slash bash, the bash program is contained in that bin directory. Data, you may not have this, but it might be where some miscellaneous data files are stored. Users on the Mac, at least, is where personal user directories are. So if you share a computer or you have multiple user accounts on your Mac, there's gonna be different directories in users for each of those accounts. And then temp is, is also very common. That's for temporary storage files. A lot of times your browser will use temp to download kind of temporary files to your system so that you can look at them um, and so on. So our current directory, as we saw, it was inside users. Uh, and so just, just as, a, as a kind of reprise on this slash character, if you see it at the beginning of a path, that is referring to the root directory or the top of your file system, which you can think of as this hierarchy. When it's used as a separator between directories, it will appear inside the path. So slash users, that first slash refers to the root directory, but then users slash R Markello, that's just a separator between users and the R Markello directories. So if we take a peek inside the users directory, we can see that there's you know, three different users on this imaginary thing that I pulled from the software carpentry's lesson. Um, if you're the only user on your computer, you're likely the only person in that directory. But shared computers can have multiple if you've ever used kind of a, if you've ever done remote work where you've connected to a server or things like that, chances are that server had multiple users and you had your own kind of home directory. Um, and when you open a new terminal, it defaults generally to your home directory, uh, which tends to be, you know, slash here, like user slash Nell or user slash R Markello. That's the directory that's opened when I just, you know, open up a new terminal on my computer. Uh, so again, we're gonna remind ourselves where we are, uh, which you use the PWD command, and then how we list the contents of our directory, that is the LS command. Uh, so I am in users slash R Markello, and I have these, I don't know, uh, 18 different directories and uh, things in my home home directory. Uh, so everyone else should have uh, should have that or something similar to that as well. So ls prints the contents of your current working directory. It is perhaps the most common command to run uh, beyond like pwd. So you're usually going to be moving around directories, listing what's inside, reminding yourself where you are. Uh, and so it can be helpful to, to kind of give us a little bit more information about the contents of our directory uh, by providing an option to the ls command. And so here, what we're going to do is we're going to type um, ls and then space hyphen and then capital F. If we run that command, it looks, the outputs are going to look very, very, very similar to the first command. Uh, the only thing that's changed now is that you can see that we have these um, trailing slashes on each of the, the things listed. Um, and so what the F command does is it adds a marker to the end of each of the contents. If the you know, content has a slash, that means that this is a directory. If it has an at symbol, that means that it's a link to something else, like a shortcut. Um, and if it has a star, that indicates that it's an executable, like a script or a, a kind of program that you've installed. Um, your contents may also be color coded and or bolded um, or like, you know, shaded depending on your default options and what your operating system is. Um, and so that's also very helpful for discerning between the, the contents of your directory at, at a quick glance. 
So note, right now my home directory contains only subdirectories. There are no links, there are no executables, and there are no files. Files would have no trailing option. It would just be the name if it was a file. Your, uh, so someone just raised, my ls command shows me in the mini conda env. Is this normal on Windows? So I'm assuming that you're in your uh, WSL, and when you say you're in your mini conda env, I'm assuming you mean that it says like slash home slash a albury slash mini conda three slash something else. Uh, if so, that may just be because your terminal dropped you into that, uh, you know, kind of by default. Totally fine. Uh, we are going to get to how to change your directory uh, in just a sec. So no need to be worried right now. Uh, so next, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, the general syntax of a shell command. So there's kind of three parts that we're going to have. So if we type the following command, ls space hyphen capital F space slash. Um, and again, I'm really bad. I don't actually know the difference between what the forward slash and the backward slash is. I'm pretty sure this is a forward slash. So we're going to go with forward slash, and that's what I'm going to be referring to this as for the rest of the lecture. If I'm totally wrong, please correct me in the group chat. I will probably continue saying forward slash for the rest of the lecture anyways. Um, <laughs> great, JB, slash, that is a forward slash. So if we type this, ls hyphen f uh, forward slash we get a, a different listing than what we got before. Uh, and so we have three things here that we need to break down. We have, the first is a command, that's ls. We then have an option, uh, that hyphen f. Options in the shell are also sometimes referred to as flags or switches. So you may say, you know, write this command with the f flag. That would mean the hyphen f. And then we also have an argument here. We provided that forward slash as an argument to our command. Uh, so diving down into these a little bit more. Um, options change the behavior of a command. So they generally start with either a single hyphen or a double hyphen, uh, and they are case sensitive. So if I typed ls hyphen lowercase f versus ls hyphen uppercase f, I'm gonna get different outputs. Uh, so as an example, ls hyphen s is going to display the quote unquote size of the contents of a provided directory. So if we type ls hyphen s, um, the size here is a little kind of a uh, little weird. It's not actually like the disk space of these, these things. You know, obviously I have a whole bunch of things in my applications directory, but it's how much that given thing is taking up in terms of uh, block size. We don't have to worry about it too much, but for the purposes of, um, of right now, uh, directories take up zero of these size variables. Um, but to highlight that uh, these things are case sensitive, if I type ls hyphen uppercase s, I get a totally different output. Um, and so, so, so it is really important that you need to be paying attention to these as, as you're typing your options. Uh, what about if you type an invalid option? So if you type ls hyphen j on your computer, uh, you're going to get this or something very similar to this output. Um, ls illegal option, then hyphen hyphen space j. You know, so it kind of strips out that hyphen from the option, uh, but this, this does let you know like something in your command was, was, uh, was wrong. So check the options that you provided and make sure that they, they are valid. And then helpfully it will try and list this little kind of usage snippet. So it says ls, and then it lists every available option for me that I could provide to ls, and then uh, these, these arguments that we, we are going to talk about in just a second. So arguments, or sometimes called parameters, these are what your commands are operating on. They are only sometimes optional. So ls can optionally take an argument. Other commands require arguments. Um, and so in certain cases, when they're optional, providing them will change the behavior uh, of the command. So for example, if I just type ls, I get, again, my, my home directory versus I could also type ls desktop data shell slash data, um, and I get a completely different thing. For those of you who, uh, who are on the WSL and put the um, data slash shell directory on your Windows desktop, you are not going to be able to type this command as uh, as everyone else. For the rest of you, 
you should be able to just type ls desktop data slash shell slash data as long as desktop was one of the things that you saw in your first ls um, if you're on the wsl uh, it is going to be a little bit more a little bit trickier to to get to um, what you are going to have to do is you're going to have to change your directory uh, to to find that so we're going to get to that in a sec for the purposes of right now you don't need to type this command because it will error um, we're gonna we're gonna just talk a little bit about more of the structure of commands and uh, and then we'll talk about changing directories I'll tell you how to change your directory to get to be able to type these things in, in, in a sec so just hang tight for a bit um, so LS has a ton of options as we saw before it listed all of those basically like every letter in the alphabet except for J uppercase and lowercase um, and so it's very useful to be able to find out about those there's two ways to do that and it depends on your operating system uh, one is to type man ls. Um, so, so we, all right, I'm going to get through this, and then I am going to, to, to address some of the contents in the chat. Um, one is to type man ls, or sometimes you can type the command hyphen hyphen help. Uh, this is going to vary based on your command and your operating system, but I would recommend that you try man first. Man here stands for manual. Uh, it's not to do with like man versus woman. Uh, so it stands for manual. So if we do this, if I type man ls, uh, what I get is this very little helpful thing. Uh, if you're typing this in the terminal, what this is going to do is it's going to put you in like a kind of separate little terminal. Um, oh, come on, I can't scroll. What? No, I enabled scroll. No. Okay. Uh, it's fine. Um, the thing I'm presenting and I should be able to scroll right now, but apparently I can't. So uh, if you were kind of put into a different terminal, you have this kind of thing where it has the name of the command, a synopsis of the command, and then a description of the command. You can use the up and down arrows on your keyboard to scroll through this help documentation. Um, you can also potentially use the scroll bar on your, your mouse to scroll up and down through the documentation. If you're, if you're lucky, sometimes your mouse isn't set up such that you can scroll through it. Um, or you can use the, the space bar or the B key to move. Uh, the space bar will bring you down in the terminal and the B will move you back up. Um, and then to get out of this page, you would use the uh, Q. You just press Q on your keyboard and you should be back to your terminal as before. And you should just see your last command was man ls. Uh, so these manuals are really, really, really comprehensive. Um, it has every command and every option that you could possibly provide to the command, the description of what they do, some examples, a whole bunch more detail about like how the command can be changed based on environmental variables. Um, and then a whole bunch of like kind of see also things that you might want to refer to when you're learning about this command. Um, so this is very helpful. Going to take a quick break to respond to some of the questions in the chat. Jake asks, Ross, how did you type the directory so fast? Is there some sort of completion option? Um, yes. So there is a completion option. Uh, I, if you are typing, uh, let's go to, go to the next thing. If you're typing, for example, I was typing ls desktop, um, there is something called tab completion. So I can start to type and then I can hit tab and it will generally either show you the options that you could possibly autofill or just autofill the option if there's only one option. Uh, so that can be really nice, that little I, this, uh, this tab completion as you're typing through uh, directories and files on your computer, you can kind of start typing and you know data hyphen shell, data, um, and you just hit tab and it will kind of take you through the rest of it. Uh, Yep, and then do we always need to write the full path to reach a specific directory? Uh, we're gonna get into full or absolute versus relative paths in just a sec when we talk about um, changing directories. So the answer is no, short answer, but um, we'll talk about that in, in just a sec. So LS has a ton of different options we talked about. Um, we can combine those options. Uh, and so if the options are single letters, you can use the same hyphen flag. So if I type ls hyphen f s uh, and then, you know, desktop, um, sorry, desktop data shell slash data, that is going to do something very different than if I just typed hyphen ls f, 
or if I just type type in ls f. So combining things, you know, does change the functionality, and that's how you can get these really powerful commands um, by by combining those. So, uh, oh man, ignore that little thing. Uh, using the the um, the man ls command uh, as a brief exercise, I would like everyone to to find out how the hyphen l option should change the behavior of ls. Uh, so if I was to type l s L um, desktop slash data shell slash data. What is this hyphen L command going to do? I'm just going to give everyone a couple of seconds to kind of take a peek at that. Enter man uh, ls. Try and scroll down until you find the option labeled hyphen L. Read about it. Think about what it's going to do. All right, so um, if we run this, what we do is we get this output, um, ls hyphen l, and then uh, we get all of this extra stuff. So I still have all of the files that I have in this directory listed here uh, in the right hand most column, um, but I have all of these other things. So the ls hyphen l, the l kind of generally is read as long, um, and what you do is you get a lot more information. You get when your file was last modified, um, you get a bunch of things about the permissions on your files. Uh, we're not going to get into permissions today at all uh, because it's a bit of a, a tricky business. Um, you get the owner of the file, uh, and then we get the file size. Now, these file sizes are uh, in bytes, um, which isn't particularly useful. Uh, so what I would like is now go back into the man uh, for ls and try and find out what the h option does uh, for ls, how this should modify the behavior. If you already know it, great. Take a few seconds just to take a sip of water, uh, but otherwise. All right, so when I type that, I actually get absolutely nothing different. Um, but that is because the h uh, option is supposed to give you human readable size outputs. And so it needs to be combined with the L option for us to actually have any, um, for us to have any, any impact. So when I do that, now what I can see is the only difference between this output and the output up here is that um, my sizes have now uh, suffixes of the, the format. So this is this file is 283 bytes uh, versus this file up here that was previously 3,360 bytes is now 3.3 kilobytes. Uh, so this is really useful for checking uh, the, the size of your, your files in a, in a kind of quick at glance. Um, so I built in these exercises. Looking at the time, we absolutely do not have time to go through the exercises right now. Um, so we're going to skip this, uh, the slides for this, the slides, this is actually all in one big Jupyter notebook, going to talk about that tomorrow. Um, Jupyter notebook posted online, so you could at a certain later date go through these exercises if you want, but we are just going to skip that for now because we are super bad on time. My bad. Uh, exploring other directories. So providing an argument to ls lets us list the contents of other directories besides our current working directory. So we already saw that. I can type ls desktop data slash shell and it will list the directories of data slash shell. Um, for those of you on you know, kind of Mac and Linux, um, typing ls desktop, so let's just do ls desktop. This should list exactly what you see on your desktop. Your desktop on your command line is identical to the desktop that you see and you can add files to. You can see mine isn't super organized. I have this random untitled screenshot, yada, yada, yada. Um, for use, those of you using the WSL, unfortunately, the, the, you may not even have a quote unquote desktop directory in your home directory. Um, and so this is gonna be a little bit different. I did talk about how we're gonna be able to change directories and we're gonna get into that um, now. So we can uh, list the contents of one of the directories on the desktop. So I'm gonna do desktop data slash shell. We see that. Um, 
or we can actually change to a different directory moving out of our home directory. Uh, and so the way that we can, that I can do that is I can say CD desktop and then C, CD data slash shell and then CD data. Um, and so here the CD command stands for change directory and it changes the shells idea of what directory we're in. Um, so from the shells point of view, you are now in a different directory. If I type LS, I'm going to get something totally different. Um, the above command changed us one by one. I went into the desktop, into data hyphen shell, and then into data, and there was no output. Uh, so CD, unlike LS, doesn't by default list uh, an output, and that's totally normal uh, and expected. And so we can then check that this worked by typing PWD. Um, and I can make sure that you know, I, I have the contents of the directory by typing ls hyphen f. For those of you on the WSL, um, we talked about kind of the, the, the file system hierarchy. WSL is a bit special. Um, and so your, your normal direct file system, your C drive is actually quote unquote mounted to your WSL. Uh, so what I'm gonna have you do is uh, since you downloaded and unzipped it onto your desktop, for those of you on Mac and Linux, hopefully you were able to CD to desktop data shell and data and that worked for you. For those of you on the WSL, uh, you are going to need to CD to mount, MNT, which stands for mount, slash C, uh, and then slash, and it's generally gonna be users, uh, slash your Windows username. So the best thing to do here is to type slash mount slash she slash users slash and then hit tab. And the terminal should kind of auto populate with options for you. Um, one of them might be like default, but the other one should be your Windows username, whatever that is, type that in here. So R Markello, uh, and then you should be able to change, then you should say be able to add desktop. That command should work. Uh, and then you can do data shell slash data. And you should be there. Uh, in the future, I'm going to be referring to kind of CD a bit. If you need to change to this directory, you're going to have to kind of add this to the beginning um, of your command, this whole mount C users uh, and then your Windows username. I apologize. This is was not totally planned uh, well on my part for those of you using the WSL, um, but that's that's how it's going to be. So, whoa, moving on. Uh, how do I get out of here? So we can go down in directories as we just did. So again, just gonna remind myself, it's telling me that there are too many arguments. Uh, so if there's telling you that there are too many arguments, you may have a space in your username. If you have a space in your Windows username, what you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to type CD and then double quotes, mount slash C slash users slash my username with spaces slash desktop and try that, uh, and that should fix it. So as a reminder, uh, I'm currently in uh, my user slash armarkello slash desktop slash data type and shell slash data. Um, if I want to go back to data shell, which is one directory quote unquote above me, if I type CD data shell, I get this error, no such file or directory. Uh, and that's because CD can only see inside your current directory and data shell is above my current directory. So there's a special notation to move one directory up and that is CD dot dot. Uh, and that will take me up a level. Here dot dot refers to the directory containing this one, also referred to as the parent of the current directory, sometimes the root of the current directory, although that gets confusing with that whole slash, which is your root of your file system. So uh, let's check if we did the CD dot dot that we are where we think we are. So if I type PWD, I am now one directory up in users armorkello desktop data slash cell or shell. So hopefully those of you who are on Windows were able to switch over to the desktop, you were able to navigate around um, and you're now, you're now here with us. So LS is supposed to see the contents of our directory, but that dot dot was not anywhere. Uh, in those co listed contents before. Uh, and that's because dot dot is a special directory that's normally hidden. We can provide an additional argument to uh, LS to make it appear. How can we move up by more than one? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and we will get to it in, uh, actually, we're not gonna get to it in a sec. So I will tell you in a sec, but first let's list 
um, let's list list the all of the the directories. So if I type ls hyphen f and then add a lowercase a, now I see dot and dot dot um, here dot dot as I said the parent directory the dot here refers to the current working directory seems a little bit weird that our current working directory has a special notation but this is this is very important for the file system it needs to be able to see um, kind of all of the directories in a current thing um, so sorry um, just okay so answering cat's question uh, how can we move up by more than one so if I want to, so when I was changing down directories, I did this desktop hyphen data slash shell hyphen or, or forward slash data. If you want to do the reverse, you can do dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot, and you will be taking up however many directories that is. Um, this can be a little bit annoying because you're like, all right, if I go up three directories, where does that leave me? Um, so on it, some, sometimes if you want to go up uh, several levels, it's easier to actually work from the top down. So for example, if I wanted to navigate back to my, my home directory, I would probably type cd user slash rmarkello, then trying to count how many steps it would take me to come out of the directory that I'm currently in. Um, and then Miguel asks, so basically it would be better to use a Unix-based system to use shell in a more natural way and take full advantage of it. I wouldn't necessarily agree. So the, yes, the Unix-based systems are kind of, the shell is, is naturally built into them. All of the commands are actually executing, you know, that you use via the GUI are executing shell commands. Uh, and that's not quite the same on Windows um, because Windows is, is based on a totally different underlying uh, operating system structure. Um, but you can still take full advantage of the shell on Windows using the WSL. So, you know, using the WSL, you're still going to be able to, to run all of the same commands as somebody who's using a Mac or a Linux or any of those sorts of systems. Uh, it's just that your operating system isn't by default using the shell to run its processes. Um, so if hopefully that the maybe balanced answer to your question. Uh, so that the last command did not reveal a bash profile. Uh, but um, if I cd to my user slash r markello and I type ls f a, I see a whole bunch of files that I did not see listed in my home directory before, including the dot x authority, dot bash history, dot bash profile, all of these things. Um, the dot prefix is reserved for configuration files on most systems, uh, and it, it prevents them from cluttering the terminal when you use ls. So these are things that different programs will use. Um, so I can see a, a dot docker for use in docker, dot git config for use with git. Um, and so I don't really generally want to see those by default. So if I just type lsf, they're hidden. Um, so when people refer to quote unquote dot files, they're generally referring to those sorts of things. So again, the, the most common commands that I think that anyone is, is going to use in the terminal, in, in the shell, pwd, um, or, you know, pwd, cd, and ls. So uh, cd, if I just type it, if you type it alone, I, again, Windows users, this is going to do something a little bit different from you. If I just type cd with no arguments, it takes me to my users slash rmarkello directory. That is my, it's called my home directory. Um, and this is very useful if you've gotten lost. So again, as I said, if you're somewhere deep, deep in your file system, and you want to go back to your home directory, you can just type cd with no arguments and it'll take you back there. Uh, if I go back to my data shell slash data directory, uh, I can do that and then make sure that I'm actually there, type pwd, and I am where I think I am. Um, so again, we can string together paths with this slash separator and instead of changing one directory at a time. So you can use dot dot slash dot dot to go up a couple directories, desktop slash data shell to go down a couple directories um, at a time. And so there's this idea of relative versus absolute paths uh, that Miguel had asked about. So we've been using relative paths thus far to change directories and list their contents. So relative here always refers to where you currently are, your current working directory. Um, the alternative is an absolute path. The absolute path starts at the root directory, that first slash, and works down from there. So that absolute directory is what's printed when I type pwd. That is the absolute path to where I am. Um, and so I can provide that, that entire path to my cd command, and that will work. And I will be exactly where I think I am. 
um, and the contents are, whoop, come on, are exactly the same uh, as before. So sometimes it's useful if you know the full path to specify that absolute thing, but it can be really useful to, to just do the relative as well. If, if you, know, you, are, you know where you are and you just wanna go down a single directory, but you have you know, your 20 directories within your file system, you don't wanna have to type all of those out. Uh, some helpful shortcuts. Um, the shell interprets the tilde character as your home directory. So cd tilde cd and cd slash user slash armarkello all get me to the same place. Um, and so actually, and uh, and so you know if I type cd slash and then I type oh, come on pwd, I am in my home directory just as I expect. Um, if you're unsure, you can determine what your home directory is via the environmental variable. So just like we typed echo shell, if you type echo dollar sign home, uh, that is going to tell you what your shell thinks of as your home directory. Generally, it's your user directory, but it can be different. Um, uh, and you can kind of change that as you, as you see fit. Um, the, I have a bunch of exercises that I, I just tried to, uh, tried to add here. We are totally out of time. I dramatically overestimated uh, how short one hour was. So, Russ, I think, I think it probably is fine if you can take uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, to maybe uh, give another view of the, uh, the, the key aspects in the, in the rest of the presentation, or is that going to yeah. be too, 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 uh, I mean, too short and you want to like reschedule something? Um, yeah, you know, I think that, I think that, Honestly, these three commands are going to get you pretty far, uh, or four commands, you know, CD, PWD, LS, uh, are going to get you pretty far in the shell, honestly, uh, all things considered. But there are, there are a few others that uh, are very, very useful. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to uh, not that far, geez, Louise, um, to working with files and directory. Um, files and directories really quickly. I apologize for the speed at which we're going to go through this. Again, dramatically underestimated how short one hour was for trying to get through all of these things. Um, so we're, we're going to jump, we're going to jump right here. Um, we were just navigating things, uh, but now we want to, we want to work with them. So quickly going to remind ourselves where we are. Um, and I want to change to, if everyone can change to that desktop, uh, data slash shell directory. That would be fantastic. Um, and then we can just, uh, yeah, well. So if everyone's there, uh, what we're gonna do is, come on. And now my computer is not liking this. Ah, that's why. So we're gonna create a directory. Create directories use the make dir command or the make directory. So if we are, uh, you know, mostly grad students, if you type make dir thesis, uh, this is going to show up. Uh, since we provide the relative path, it's just going to be in our current directory. Uh, and so we can check that by typing ls f again. I now see thesis over here. Uh, so this is how you would create a directory. Same as you would do by just clicking, you know, create new folder um, on your on your file explorer, um, which I say right here as well, getting ahead of myself. Um, some good naming conventions. You should not use spaces uh, in, your, in your file names or your directory names. Uh, you sh shouldn't begin the name with a hyphen. Um, so you want your directory and file names to stick with letters, numbers, the period sign, uh, hyphen and underscore. Avoid other special characters like the, all of the things above the numbers on your keyboard. Um, the reason that you want to avoid spaces is because as I think a cat or, or someone in the, the chat had an issue earlier, um, I, I forget who, uh, ah, Ariel. Uh, if you have a space, it kind of starts to interpret that as a separate argument or command. Um, and so you have to have double quotes around it to, to be able to work with that. So a good rule is just don't use spaces when you're naming things. Um, so next, what we're going to do is we're going to navigate to the thesis directory and create a new file. So what we can do is we can type cd thesis. 
Um, why are my keyboard shortcuts not working? And then what you're going to do is you're going to type nano draft.txt. I am not going to do that here because uh, nano on my presentation software is not going to work. But if you type nano draft.txt, what you're going to do is you're going to get a very nice little uh, command line text editor. It only works with plain text. You can't use graphs, figures, tables, images, just uh, the things on your keyboard. Um, you may be familiar with graphical editors like gedit or notepad or text edit it. If you have command line experience, you may be familiar with things like Emacs or Vim. Um, but Nano uses the, uh, the control key to make changes. So you can type stuff. So I, I would recommend, you know, type, type a line in Nano. Um, and then you will need to save uh, that. So you, um, <clears throat> at the bottom of your terminal, what you're going to see is you're going to see a bunch of like, you know, star, uh, uh, uppercase, what is that, caret G, get help, caret O, write out. Um, all of those specify is that if you, you use control and then the keyboard character next to it, it's going to do that command. Um, so if, after you've typed your thing, if you type control X, uh, the bottom terminal is gonna display, it's gonna say, do you wanna save this, uh, you know, and overwrite this file? If you just hit enter a couple of times, you should be out of your terminal, out of nano and back in your terminal. Um, so we can, Again, there's no scroll bar. So once you've done that, uh, if, you've t if you've actually created it, you should be able to type LSF, uh, and ideally you should see uh, draft.txt there. I do not have it because I did not just, just run that command as we saw, um, but there are other ways to create it if you didn't run nano. Uh, so we can make a file and immediately add its context with nano, but we can also make a fi empty file by typing touch my file.txt. Uh, that command is not going to show anything. Uh, it just creates an empty file. And so we can see what that file is with ls hyphen uh, L. I now see my file. I see that the size is zero bytes. It's totally empty. You should also be seeing a draft.txt that is more than zero bytes, um, ideally. Uh, and so those are the two ways on the, via the command line that you can easily create files. You can either open up a text editor and make the file, or you can just touch these empty files. Um, but we're going to start by going back to our data shell directory. So if we go to desktop data slash shell, we now have that thesis slash draft dot text file, which isn't totally informatively named. So we're going to move it. Uh, and the way that you move files is via the MV command. Um, so sorry, I am just, I didn't actually create the file. So if we type move thesis draft, where am I? Uh, I was in data, data slash. So for it, we see thesis, ls thesis, I should see both draft and my file.txt, move thesis slash draft.txt. And I'm going to rename it mm, thesis final.txt. When you enter that command, uh, you won't get any outputs. Uh, but the first argument of move is the file we're moving. The last argument is where we want it to go. Uh, so what we can do is we can make sure that that worked by typing ls thesis. And we'll see that we no longer have draft.txt. We now have final.txt. Uh, obviously, not actually final, but still worth, uh, worth knowing. Notably, you can provide more than two arguments to move. So as long as the final argument is a directory. And what that means is move all of these things into this directory. So we just used it to kind of rename a file by moving it from one to the other. Uh, but you can just move files around the way you would by dragging and dropping on your, um, on your file explorer. But it's worth noting that move is actually a little bit dangerous because if the destination file already exists, move is just going to silently overwrite it. So if I say, you know, move draft.txt to final.txt and final.txt is a file that already exists, that old version is completely and irrevocably gone. Um, you can kind of address that by providing the I flag to your move. So I could have done move 
hyphen i thesis slash draft dot text to thesis slash final dot text. Uh, and that would have given me a little warning if the destination, um, if the destination kind of existed. Uh, and I would have been able to, to say, you know, no, don't overwrite. So we can, as I said, move files to a different directory rather than just renaming. So let's say I want to move thesis final dot text to my current directory. So here, that's where that dot special notation for current directory comes into effect. If I type that, um, the dot, as I said, moves current directory. So we should have moved, uh, again, not quotes, final final.txt out of the thesis into our current directory. And so let's check that that works as expected. So if I type ls slash thesis, uh, I just see my, my file. And if I type ls to list my current directories, I see final.txt right there uh, in them. Uh, I can also have typed final.txt, ls final.txt. And what it would do is it would just echo that, that file. Um, and so when you provide a file name to, instead of a directory, it lists only that file name if it exists. Otherwise, it throws an error. So if I type ls, it's going to tell me that no such file or directory exists, which is very useful um, for being able to kind of determine whether or not uh, a file exists quickly on your computer. I'm um, going to jump skip that exercise. Uh, the next command is the copy command. This is very useful. Again, making copies of things, generally something that you'd want to do. So like move, it has a very similar syntax. I would type copy final.txt to thesis final.txt. Um, and then what I can do is type, I want to make sure that both of those exist. So I can provide more than one uh, file name to ls, and it will print both of them out. If one of the file names doesn't exist, it will print out the ones that do and give you an error for the ones that don't. So I see that both of those things exist as we expected. Um, and copy has this nice recursive flag if I want to copy a directory and all of the contents beneath it. So if I want to back up my thesis, uh, I can type copy hyphen r thesis slash thesis backup. Um, and then I can make sure that those directories are both uh, present and identical by typing ls thesis and ls thesis backup. And it will list thesis, here's the contents, thesis backup, here's the contents. Um, so is there, so if someone just asks, uh, and this is a very, very important question, is there a trash in Linux for the move command which overwrites files? Uh, Jake specified, no. There is no trash on your terminal, in your shell. So if you move something and rename it and overwrite a file, the old files is gone. Uh, we uh, are, I'm going to jump ahead. It, again, I had a couple exercises um, that we're not going to have time for. Removing, um, I'm going to remove the final.txt file. If I want to remove this final.txt file, I can type rm final.txt. That file is now gone forever. Um, and we can check that it's gone. No more final.txt. Um, so that's what I just checked. But deleting is forever. So move and overwriting a file or using rm to remove a file is incredibly dangerous because your command line has no concept of a trash. Uh, this can seem a bit scary, uh, kind of is. And there's a, I, I, I cannot think of a single person who has not accidentally deleted something in the terminal that they did not mean to. Um, it's, it's a universal of people who are using the shell and the terminal to do any work whatsoever. Um, yes, it is quite sad. Um, so, so you do really, really need to be careful about it. Thankfully, uh, the terminal, yes, so you should use rm hyphen i for a safer experience. If you're trying to remove thousands of files, that can be a huge pain, but um, it, it is much safer. So if I wanted to remove a directory, unlike a file, if I type rm thesis, I get a, an error. Thesis is a directory. Um, rm only works on files by default, but you can tell it to recursively de delete a directory and all of its contents with the r flag. So rm hyphen r thesis, that directory is now gone. Reminder, we did make a backup before, um, but because deleting is forever, 
and RMR will delete that directory as well as everything inside of it, uh, the RMR command should be used with great caution. Um, as JB mentioned in the chat, RMR-RI, probably the safest thing to do. Um, so, so, you know, the, the things that we've just gone over this, uh, so, you know, copy, move, and remove, um, those three commands are kind of your, your biggest uh, power tools for kind of modifying your file structure that you navigate with PWD, CD, and LS. Um, I think that we're just going to kind of jump right to the summary because I'm a little bit over time and I really, really, really don't want to cut Elizabeth short on Git GitHub since that is the primary way you're going to be working on your projects for the rest of the week. Um, so thankfully, you're going to have a lot more opportunities to use the bash shell throughout the rest of the course. We're going to be building on it. Uh, Elizabeth's going to be using some of these commands that I just showed you uh, right now in her in her lecture as she, when, when she gets started. Um, so the bash shell is very powerful, dangerously so at times, um, but it, it provides a really nice command line interface to your computer and file system. Uh, makes operating on files quickly and uh, efficiently very easy. Uh, you can kind of quickly iterate over things. You can you know copy and rename mass files um, as you see fit, and then you can string together sequences of these uh, to, to make pipelines. We didn't get into that a lot. Um, I am more than happy to chat with people kind of offline or uh, in the Slack or you know, kind of in the coming weeks about how, how you can make um, powerful pipelines out of shell commands. But before I leave, I do have a little bit of a soapbox that I need to jump on. Bash is fantastic. You're gonna find yourself using it a lot. Navigating your file system is, is, is very useful and quick and easy to do in the shell. However, for creating complex pipelines and programs, I strongly encourage you to use what I'm gonna call a newer programming language. This is things like Python um, or R or MATLAB. Um, Bash is uh, fantastic. I use it all the time. Again, that script that you all ran for checking your installs was written in Bash, but Python and kind of newer, more dynamic programming languages uh, allow for a, a lot better control flow, error handling, debugging. Um, and so while you will see a number of programs built in Bash, uh, I would strongly encourage you consider whatever you're thinking about doing. Do you need to use Bash for it? Or can you use something like Python or R or MATLAB uh, for the same purposes? You're still gonna use Bash for a lot, but before you go and create these kind of really huge, heavy uh, pipelines, this is something to consider. Um, a few quick references, the man, new, the you know, GNU manual, uh, learning the Bash shell is a great book from O'Reilly. Uh, and then there are, you know, a dozen, uh, a dozen is a dramatic understatement. There's like a million different learn Bash online. Um, as you're using Bash in the rest of the course, like I said, I'm more than happy to field questions uh, as you go through. But that is all the time we have for now. Uh, I'm happy to take questions before we start with the Git GitHub. And we'll probably do about a five minute break before uh, Elizabeth hops on. So uh, any questions that you have now? Um, yes, uh, unrelated to Bash, what's the name of the presentation software that I'm using? So this presentation was actually written in a Jupyter Notebook. Um, we're gonna talk about what Jupyter Notebooks are tomorrow. Um, but you can see here, this whole presentation is just a big Jupyter notebook. And then there's this uh, presentation software called RISE, R-I-S-E, that uh, makes these really beautiful slideshows that you can kind of toggle back and forth, back and forth between. Uh, happy to post that in, um, you know, we'll create a new channel on the Slack for uh, cool tools or tool sharing, and I'll post, post some links there. Any other Bash related questions or shell related questions or, or anything like that before? Before I, Maybe get going. I, have, I have one before uh, while uh, Elizabeth is setting up. Um, uh, you haven't talked about variables in Bash at all. Do you want to say just one a couple of sentences of uh, uh, what are variables and uh, what are they useful for? Um, yeah, so I, I did kind of uh, briefly reference these at the beginning when I was talking right. about the, the shell um, yes, sure. and your home. So mm. variables are just things that you assign values to. You can in Bash, let's see if I can get a uh, Thing. I can say, you know, my variable e equals 10. And then if I want to echo that, it's going to say 10. So I can, I can assign values to variables and reuse those. Um, uh, 
I can assign, you know, a variable, a file name if I wanted. So morse.txt. And then if I say, you know, my file, remove my file, morse.txt is now gone. Um, so these are just nice little kind of abbreviations you can use or pointers you can use. Uh, again, you define it by saying the variable name and then equals with no spaces and then your, your, very, your value. And you have to prefix it with this dollar sign in order to access it. Uh, this would not work. Uh, again, my file is not a directory, so it, no lo it doesn't refer to anything. You need that dollar sign in order to access the variable. Variables make bash scripting a lot easier. As I said, I, I think I, I would recommend if you're thinking about writing a comprehensive bash script, that you pause, consider what your goals are, and maybe think about doing it in, for example, Python instead. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of motivate that tomorrow. But um, yes, variables are useful nonetheless. And maybe there's one variable that is very useful. It's the dollar path variable. Uh, that, uh, yeah. So uh, so yes, there are. So as we said, there's echo shell, echo home. Um, these these kind of all caps variables are some defaults in your environment. Dollar sign path. Uh, this will specify the command, the, 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 the directories that your bash terminal is going to search through for whatever command you typed. So if I type the command ls, my computer is going to say, does the ls command exist here? No. Does it exist here? No. Does it exist here? No. Here. Ah, I found it. And I'm going to execute that. Um, curious what it means when there are files that come up from LSA that start with the thing. Yep, that uh, special symbol is a Microsoft Word exclusive. Uh, it's like a temporary autosave file um, that existed at some point in time. Um, you can generally safely remove them, but it's, it's usually designed by Microsoft Word that kind of tilde, uh, um, tilde dollar sign is a uh, Auto save feature for Microsoft Word um, programs. Can you save bash scripts? If so, how can you run them? Yes, you can absolutely save bash scripts and you can run them. Uh, we didn't get into that today. Uh, as you saw, we barely had any time to get through even just the basics of navigating the bash terminal. Uh, I'm happy to discuss that at a later date. Maybe uh, on Friday, we have some free time. If we want to revisit bash, we can do so there. Um, but generally what you would do is you type your script out in you know, CD, LS, all your commands in a text file. You'd save it as a .sh, so my script.sh, and then you can run it by typing bash my script.sh, and that will run your script. Um, that's a very, very brief overview of that process. Like I said, I think we can maybe dive back into that as we see fit um, based, on, based on need at a later date.